what we were talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and that type of stuff. Um, so where do I start? Introduce yourself. Yeah. All right. What do you do? <laughs> uh, so my name is Chris Moragori. I'm the founder of Minecraft Infinite. We, the company that I run, focuses on using 3D printing to uh, improve the outcomes of surgery. Yeah. The problem that we are solving is actually a five billion uh, population strong issue, because we, we all know it's general knowledge when you go for surgery going to cost a pretty penny yeah and if you consider that uh, a very very small percentage of the population is insured it becomes now a situation so what are we trying to solve how are we trying to solve it uh, we've been able to observe that the main variable uh, or the modifiable via variable in surgery is time so a surgery that takes longer it's more expensive the wound is exposed for longer uh, the operation is definitely more complex, so the recovery time is longer. And if you look at the costs on the hospital, the anesthesia overhead costs, the theater itself is real estate, there's cost to that. On the patient uh, healing, if it takes, I mean, uh, if, 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 you have, if, you've, if you've broken a limb, you know it takes at least six weeks to have the cast. So if you have a, a cast going from the hip all the way to the ankle, you are pretty much sunk for the next three months. Yeah? So that is a cost. So the, the question that you're asking is, how could we be able to impact that? How can we be able to reduce that? So what you do is, uh, if you strategically use 3D printing, you're able to impact it, and this is how. Say someone has come in with um, a defect or a trauma, tumor, whatever, and they need to get fixed. So what you're able to do at the very basic level, you're able to take the patient's data, uh, and then you create 3D models, patient-specific models of the same, that are one-to-one. And then the surgeon, before they go into theater, they already have the model, they can plan the surgery, they can see where the defect is, they can, they can communicate with the patient. If there are implants to be prepared, they can be prepared before surgery. If there are bone crafts to be harvested, the measurements can be taken before surgery, so that when they go in, they already have the data, and they go in, they open up the patient, do the resection, reconstruct, the outcome is improved. On average, you've been saving at least uh, 25% of the theater time, and that is significant. Considering we have a surgery taking 10 hours, 25% of that, you do the math. And if you look at hospitals that charge uh, a certain fee per minute, you now start seeing the, the figures now, the impact of that. The other level which we are now getting into is, um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's one level below tissue printing where it's called now, we're printing now what is called biocompatible, biodegradable implants. So we print lattices made of a very special polymer. It's actually the same, rather it's similar to the same compound that uh, is used by women in uh, the, the contraceptive that is injected into them. Yeah? So what happens is we're able to print out a lattice with it, like the way we're building, you know, building those uh, iron rods and then you pour cement inside. So if you print out the lattice, it can be able to be implanted rather fixed where there's missing bone, and then bone will regrow on it. So the end result of that implant is in three years' time, rather over three years, it will slowly biodegrade through a certain uh, biochemical process called the TCA cycle. If you remember biology, where glucose comes in and then we get ATP plus water. So that is the same. Uh, chemical process that goes into. So that makes it very effective in creating lattices. And if, if we do that right, effectively, we'll have eliminated the use of bone grafts and also we'll have um, eliminated the use of expensive implants. And now that is uh, where we're heading to. There are very many verticals in it and very many areas of research. If you draw a line and then you start seeing what kind of studies could be done, what kind of areas could be worked on, it's amazing. So for me, um, it's, a, it's a beautiful place. I think it's important to live uh, according to your own philosophy. For me, mine has always been research first. It's, it's always been maintain a curious mind. And this company gives me that. So I'm always constantly motivated, having conversations, meeting guys, and constantly growing myself. So generally, oh. topic at hand. Yeah. So, um, we, 
we received an invitation by the AHK uh, to go for an exposure trip to to Germany, Munich in particular. And an exposure trip, it's an exposure trip. You know, you get, you know people call it benchmarking. Yeah. So it's, it's an exposure trip. So what happened was we've been in the startup so so trying to offer here so we know how the ecosystem works here. But then it will be important to also expand your horizon Kidogo, and then be able to see what else is happening on the other side. So we were lucky enough to go to Germany and uh, we spent a week and it was interacting with startups, going to their accelerator hubs, incubation hubs, talking to founders, talking to different players in health and all that. And there are notable differences between here and there. Before we go into that, maybe mm -hmm. talk a little bit about something you said that was quite important. Which was? Which was, why, why do you think mm -hmm. this happened? Why, did, why are they yeah. doing this? Is there the goodness of their heart? Mm -hmm. What's the move here? Yeah. Um, the move by the Germans. As okay. far as far I, I, I don't know. Okay. I will say as far as I as far as I can tell, the um, you know we're not living in a, in an island. We're not living in a silo. We're living in a geopolitical space. Yeah. Um, all the tech that we have right now, Facebook, LinkedIn, Google, they began as startups. You have to remember that. And the ones that are running the show. When they began, governments were blind to them. They were oblivious to them because uh, the technology of back then, the, the guys who had a say, they were industrials, industrialists. Yeah? Manufacturing was a thing. But then these small guys came in, just a couple of university guys, 20 years down the line, they're the behemoths. They're now shaping laws and data and all that. So any smart government will realize that the best way to be able to uh, secure their position in the future is to have a uh, grasp on startups as they are coming up. That is what is called now a bit of soft power. So, for example, let's say if all of you guys um, you want to pursue this degree and then you are taken to China, to the best university, taught Chinese, and then you still come back, you, you get, there's going to happen. If a thousand of you has happened, 10 years down the line, it will be very easy for the, the Chinese government to be able to have a certain influence on, on things because you already gravitated towards that. It only takes a small critical mass of people to, to control a larger mass. So they'll look at it. It's, it's also a bit of that kind of soft power. And we have to see from the fact, from the perspective of, um, in many ways, it is to your advantage to start looking at things in the macro. If you're in business and you haven't looked at the best elite analysis of the macro environment, number one is political. So you have to start looking at the geopolitical things where you're going to be 10 years from now. Because you'll be here, you should be somewhere else. And the world won't be as it is, it will be somewhere else. So you have to start looking at things from that kind of a bigger lens or the bigger window. So now to the nitty gritty, the differences mm. between what you observe between the ecosystem there, how things work. Mm. Um, where do I start? What kind of startups? What's the common denominator in most startups here? Is it hardware or software things? Software. It's soft, right? Apps, yeah. uh, coding, anything to do with code. That's where most people um, have invested a lot of time in. And what, what's the level of cooperation between different guys? On a scale of one to five, where one is very poor and five is perfect. Eh? One, how many for one? Those are two. Two, how many for two? How many for three? I think the guys who chosen one, the other ones, it's not a proper statistical figure, but it shows that we do not work in cooperation. Now let me even ask another one. What's the level of cooperation between startups and industry players? By that I mean banks, I mean uh, companies, I mean universities. One, uh, one being the least level of cooperation and five being most. How many think it's one? Or how many think it's five? So if you find that there's no cooperation between the industry and the startups, yeah? So 
Um, you see, well, one thing I observed when I was there, um, the, the startups, they work very closely with institutions. We were in Bavaria, and that is where BMW is. Yeah? BMW knows IoT will help them in the sensors, and maybe, I mean, five years from now, if they get it right, they're going to be they're gonna be all right. So no. Yeah. Allianz, the insurance that, that owns, I think, Bayern, the Bayern Stadium, yeah? Yeah. Um, they know that fintech and all that big data will have a good play, uh, will be beneficial to them if they start incorporating these things right now, five years to come. But who's really in the trenches doing the work? Is it BMW? Is it Allianz? Is it the big companies? Or is, or is it the small players? It's the small players. So, no. yeah. so they know that. And they, they actively uh, work with them. They actively cooperate with them. So you see that there's that element of trust between the behemoths and the small player. Because they understand the small guys, they, they have a different perspective of things. They are nimble and they are very highly motivated. So if we give them the money, if we give them the support, it will most likely be to your own benefit. Now, if you have a startup and you're trying to solve a technical issue, there's only so much you can do. So, no. so what's the most obvious um, institute to work with to improve your technical capacity? University, right? Yeah. But how many universities here, public and private universities here, are actively working with startups? Strath? Yeah. Strath is trying, yeah? yeah? It's trying. But what about the... Strath is only working on the business side, mostly. But then what about the technical area of things? Nairobi University, JQuart, Took, and all that. What about that? What was the level of cooperation between startups and that? It's almost, it's almost as if there's a tab of work, I say, mm -hmm. for his... Uh, as opposed to collaboration, it's mm -hmm. more of a fight. No one wants to work with the other. Yeah. yeah. Especially when it comes to IP. Yeah. If you work with the university and you generate IP, man, you'll be sad. You know? Mm -hmm. So, on the other side, I mean, I, I, did, I, I did study their IP laws and all. That was not my, my, my docket. Yeah? If you spend more time there, it will have been clearer. But, you see that there's a, there's a very high level of cooperation between the university and the startups. And what is the impact of that? Let's say, for example, you're building um, an app in, not even an app, let's say you're building a hardware product and you do not know about the mechanics. It will be of the university's best interest to be able to assign a master student to come in and solve that problem, problem and write a paper on it. Yeah? Because if they're able to do that, as a master student, they'll have a bigger perspective and it will actually validate the industrial application of what you're doing. And what happens to the startup? Two things, it gets validation, and number two, it solves a world problem. So you find that there, there's that very active participation between the university and here. So there you have it. Number one, there's a lot of cross collaboration between startups. Number two, there's a lot of collaboration between startups and what I call the industry behemoths. And number three, there's also collaboration between universities. But then when they looked further at the kind of, um, but I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not talking statistics, I'm only sharing my experience. Eh? So it should be taken for the absolute truth. There could be discrepancies if you go deeper, but from what I was able to, to observe, you'll find, um, for example, a company, a startup has a founder who's not a technical founder, but then he's brought in on board. Um, for example, if it's in engineering, an electrical engineer, mechanical engineer, industrial engineer, design engineer. Now all these guys are now building a product that looks like a small industry in itself. So they are solving a problem if, let's say, it's analyzing the cup, for example. So they're able to analyze the cup. They're able to not only analyze the cup, but then they're also able to design the cup, manufacture a better cup, uh, take care of the logistics and the business end. So you find it's one startup that is complete on its own. But then here, there's a lot of wrangles. I think I've seen 
uh, from from um, companies trying to come up. It's a it's a founder who wants to be seen and wants to take the limelight. And if anybody challenges the limelight, it's done. It's war. Gloves gloves are off. However, um, the the last thing that 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 I saw was the approach to market, which I think is very important. Because here, here I'm not talking about uh, e, e things or other soft software app startups, robot hardware, hardcore things. Yeah? You find that a significant, rather the larger portion of the revenue comes from export. You have to really realize that. Yeah? All of us here at Nasama Pesa is only, but it's only here. <laughs> yeah? If you go, if, if you export things to China, if you have, even if it's a, even if you have a fancy cup that is made of bamboo, you won't sell it. Yeah, you'll sell it maybe in China or somewhere else. Yeah, but I, I, I haven't seen many startups here that are really focusing on on, on export. And here's the thing: there's a there's a company called Mawa in Bavaria. They sell hangers, cloth hangers, and they have a revenue of 1.2 billion euros selling hangers. 90% of their revenue is export. Makes sense. You should now start thinking about, if you're, if you're gonna start a company, don't solve a problem that is relevant here, but it also has a global uh, footing. And then if you do that, you, you increase your chances of succeeding. Awesome stuff. I have a question, but it's more of your background. I'm just listening to the beginning. You seem to have a medical background? Medicine? Pharmacy. Pharmacy. Mm. So, I mean, ideally, I'm just, of course, no one go to it, but mm. medicine seems to be in Kenya, Africa, one of those. You can get a job easily with medicine and sustain yourself for a long time. Mm. So, at what point did you decide not to? take the path that has been determined and decide, I want to start my own startup. What was that, we we'll call it, Eureka moment that made you switch and say, you know what, I don't want to do this thing that everyone does, let me do my own thing. Um, yeah. the, the thing that made me take a leap was, I began asking myself questions like, um, how come I've never seen a pharmacist practicing 10 years down the line? can see an engineer, can see an engineer, civil engineer, you can see he's building a road with a helmet and the high vis and what have you. But, uh, but, it, but it started becoming apparent that um, the course that I was in, it, there are two ways it could go. Either I go into academia or I open up a chemist. But then, man, that thing is it's difficult. If, if you, I mean, if you see the kind of... Uh, difficulty it is to grasp the dynamics in drugs and all that it's incredible but then now if you're told that the the limits of where you can go here in kenya is to open up a shop you will be very sad very quickly <laughs> yeah that, that, that's the truth so um and then also at that time i was having my own challenges in all of us normally struggle with the questions of um what am I supposed to be doing? You know, that's a age old question. What next for me? What am I supposed to be doing? So I was asking myself a lot of those questions in uni. And then there was this particular day when I realized that uh, after my first startup failed, and then I was now slowly working on 3D printing, I realized that, wait, this is, I'm more, I'm getting more satisfaction from this. If I focus the next five years in 3D printing, and if I say focus the next five years in academia, then the, it's pretty clear where I'll be, where I'll have more gratification. So I took the risk and then I, I jumped into 3D printing. Yeah. Other entrepreneurship. Yeah. But it was tough, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about that. So, yeah. Yeah. startup the, toughness experience. What's been the experience? On the, on, the, on, the, on the person or on the startup? Which one would you like to hear? Both. Would you like to hear both? Um, Sour. I, I mean, it's, it, 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 
to be yeah, meshed yeah, yeah. because one is the product of the other. Yeah? Um, when I began the when I began my crew, um, it's actually it actually has the name of my previous failed startup. So because when I began the new product line, I already have money to go for should I just tell you company? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I said I have I have I have I, actually at that time it was it was a sole proprietorship. So I remember I remember I, I, I was with my buddy. Um, this is a very close buddy of mine. It's called Ransom. So you remember the day that Boniface Mwangi went to Parliament with the MPs, yeah, yeah. with blood and all that. Yeah, yeah. That was the day I registered my company. Because I remember we went uh, down Parliament Road, and then we saw a pig in the middle of town. We were wondering, wait, that is all. What's a pig doing here? Anyway, so um, when I began my crib, I had nothing. Yeah, I had but I had nothing. I didn't have a comp. Ninety-nine percent of my work is comp. The one percent is delivery. Yeah. So I already have a comp. I already have a three D printer. But then what I had was was an idea, and the idea stemmed from a personal experience because I had uh, I, I I wrecked my uncle and I went for surgery that um, motivated me to do to venture to this field. So when I began, I was I was first of all at a loss because. Number one, this one now it, it now becomes personal, because all along I was seen, I was known as a good student, and I was going to be called a doctor, Doctor Moragori. Man, that thing is a nice feeling to imagine yourself being called that. But then now here I am, uh, I've abandoned that course. So the question becomes, now, who am I? You get, who am I? Without all the pomp, all my identity has always been pegged to. I've never been a top performer. I've never been number one. I think I was number one in class three once. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that, that was the time. I was always the guy. Apo, remember when I said top ten? Mm. Kwa class, but then kwa stream, koko page 50, yeah, number 50, 68. I was in that 68. I mean, I was I wasn't a stellar student. I'm, I said I was I wasn't. Yes, you were not too bad. I was, I was, I was, I wasn't, I wasn't like the top top student, but but, but the thing was, uh, I've never been lazy. You have to get that. I've never been lazy. Um, I've never been soft. Yeah. So these are some of the things that that I was able to carry. Now here, here I was, no identity. So who is now Chris? Sasa, you have to now model yourself anew. Yeah. Now you have to struggle with telling people, no, I abandoned pharmacy to pursue this. So now we start getting doubts. Back at home, your dad is, man, this guy, he had everything lined up, but then now he's taking this. Everybody is now confused. You know, it takes a kind of a toll on you, but then you really have to focus on why did I do it? And then you now just focus on it. Utakam could realize that um, the more you focus on things, there's a, there's, a, there's a lesson that my dad taught me when we moved to our new place and I was a small boy. He told me that before you get to this new place, you have friends waiting for you there. Even if you don't, you have friends waiting for you. So that was to tell me that it's okay to abandon, uh, to move. Moving is okay. So that was like the motivation. So I was able to transit from uh, that academia student to now an entrepreneur. It's like you're standing naked in front of everyone in front of yourself. So. I was very, very fortunate that at that time was when Gearbox Light began operating there at uh, Bishop Magwa, second floor. Uh, and, I, and I went and I spoke to Dr. Kamau Gashigi and I told him, uh, Doc, this is what I want to do. This is, this is the thing that I have and uh, I need your help to help me get it right. So he, he, he allowed me to use the space. For, for a few months working on the three. I didn't even use the 3D printers. They, I was, the thing that I was giving in exchange was because I knew chemistry, I was able to prepare the reagents to clean up their PCB thing is. Eh? So that was now the thing that I was giving in exchange. So I was there, I was seeing the 3D printers, I was learning the software that I was supposed to be using for my work. And then in time now, uh, I realized that I needed my own computer. I didn't have a comp. Yeah, and at that time I was staying in my own KSQ that was like, we kwa bed, kwa bath, 
<laughs> if you cook in the house it becomes a sauna steam bath eh? <laughs> you know so so um your time i used to i used to call my cousin he was working in town chancery so i used to tell him he's called Herman. i love him so i used to tell him uh and said he's come at night i learn and then in the morning and then I go, i'm going to go and drop it so that was how i was learning you get because if you're motivated enough everything becomes an opportunity you have to really understand Say that again, please. if if you're motivated enough everything becomes an opportunity like it's 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 really hard to to tell you the gravity or the truth in that until you are in it yeah so uh, eventually i was able to to get a small grant uh, where i bought my own 3d printer and my own laptop but then where will they place the 3d printer this in my own house I was living in an SQ, I couldn't make up a wardrobe, so all my clothes, I used to fold them, put in a bag, and I put it under my bed, because now the wardrobe was now my office, where so I, I do the work, and then I feed it, and the machine runs, after a few hours, I go and deliver the model. So that has always been the case, you move from strength to strength, pole pole. Um, initially, it was, this there's this thing that that you have to realize if, if you want to to pursue your own thing there's a there'll be um an episode in your life where loneliness will be a friend rather not isolation not loneliness isolation will be a friend because that is the only time we will be able to dig in deep and really do two things you'll be able to master yourself and master your vision because when you are alone in your own house at uh, 6 p.m. Uh, and you've been working for the last uh, so many weeks or months continuously without trust. I think we now start thinking, what have I done? What have I done? What is this all about? At that time, it doesn't seem like a thing, but later on, you come to realize that those are your best days. I don't know. In a, in a, in a way, that is how it turns out. So for me, um, at that time, I, I now began realizing that what I'm doing is starting to have an impact on people. So I approached uh, one of the professors in the university and we wrote a paper. Now, here's a dilemma. Um, I've put my academia on break and I've approached the Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery. It's, you know, it's like, it's like um, you suddenly, you, you've never been to the gym and then suddenly you remember to do weights the heaviest weight and you have to lift. You have to, if you're told you do it. Whether if you put your mind to it. So here I was, and I wrote the paper, and it got published. So that was the, the first publication that, that I ever had. And now that really started making people get, start to notice that I'm doing something. But then at the same time, you also start getting a little bit of confidence. Yeah? You get a little bit that, hey, I can do this. You start doing even more. I can do this, I can do more. Your vision was this. So you realize that what I think I could, but then suddenly what I think I can do is slightly bigger. And then you do a big thing, and then it becomes bigger. Another big thing becomes even bigger. Now, that has been my personal journey. Uh, Mbaka, uh, right now, you, it gets to a point where you're cool, you're collected. The, the, you know, if you're undecided, at being, this is called indecision, yeah? Indecision. Indecisive. Yeah, indecisive, thanks. Indecisive is expensive. If you haven't made up your mind, you'll be like, um, you'll be like an atom oscillating in the same place, but you're not really achieving much. But the moment you decide on a particular way, you have to really focus on it and you have to go the distance. You don't figure cut cutting and then you look and then you say maybe or maybe and then you start chasing the shiny things all the time you will never move uh in life you have to chase a few things and you have to make sure those things that you're chasing they resonate with who you are so for me um i began working on my crib but then my crib began working on me so that at the end of the day you end up in a place where you are more or less more insightful and you are more confident in the outlook in life. And I think it's important. It doesn't have, you don't have to do a startup. You just have to do a thing. 
even if it's a thing. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. For me, to, for me, it was my crib. Everybody can see. But the the more personal one is I realize that you just have to do a thing and you make sure you've done it well. Even if you could mop floors, go and mop the floor. Or you mop it in such a way, even if the angels are in heaven, they were like, Jesus, that guy has mopped it. You get it? Yeah. So, awesome. Mm. Questions? Actually, I have a question. It's really interesting you talk about, like, they start out in Kenya software, right? Mostly, yep. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But the interesting part is engineers and, let's say, Okay, let's just go back a bit. So, if you look at certain professions like engineering, there's the engineering board, pharmacy, there's a pharmacy board. Mm -hmm. So, there's this kind of click gatekeepers of those professions. So, I go back now to my question. So, you find that these people, let's say in third year, fourth year, they're doing projects, they've built mm -hmm. something, you know, they're doing something. But by fifth year, mm -hmm. they've clicked back, oh, I want to work at Kenha, I want to just do this. At what point, uh, what do you think? should change, especially in engineering, pharmacy, and medicine, mm. to just get these people from that thinking of, I want to be, you know, a, a doctor, I just work in this hospital, I don't want to like, start something and really pursue a certain thing. Because if you look at software, the good thing is that the, the meetups, people just share stuff and all mm. these things. But in it's engineering, formal, yeah, formal. In engineering, you don't meet civil engineers sitting down and let's mm. try and experiment. Let's build a new type of tarmac. Yeah, they don't yeah. Do that. So what's your perspective on that? Um, look, what's the average age that people go to school? They begin school. At what age? Three, three, three years, four, four years. We mean learn like you are four. Yeah. So, um, and then you graduate at what age? 24? 24. 23. 22, 23. 22, 23. 22, 23. 22, 23. Yeah. <laughs> 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 My co-founder spent six years, seven years in uni. Mandela. <laughs> Doing medicine. <laughs> Mandela. <laughs> yeah, seven years. Seven years. He took a break to, okay. to pursue his own startup. Um, so, here's the thing. You spent 20 years in school, and what does the school have? It has structure. You get, it has rows and columns, and it has a schedule. It has an eight to five, it has um, a systematic and um, self-validating system. Yeah, you've done that for 20 years. It will take a miracle to break through that mentally. You get? Mm. So when you're in uni, you are dreamy. Think about the big things. Because all of a sudden you've got a degree of freedom. Yeah? That you don't have, you don't have to be in class at 10. Or rather 8 to 5, you can be a class at 10, a class. At, so you get a bit of flexibility. So for, for this, uh, it's not even for, only for engineering. The, the, the bane for that, that you do not have startups, or rather highly, highly innovative, and out of the picture kind of uh, innovation is because we've, we have had 20 years of conditioning of a certain way of thinking. That is why you find it's preposterous for somebody who has left university, um, mechanical engineering or whichever kind of course, and to still strive for a job. Whereas they have the capacity to do whatever they want in whichever schedule and achieve in whichever way. But it is considered unconventional to have any other lifestyle other than the eight to five. That has been my observation. So how do you correct that? Um, if I say that you have to start from university, I mean from nursery, I'll be, I'll, I'll be lying. I think it's important for people to take a break, if you can career break. Small as the university can make be a job, the, the job that's entitled the state to your career. I mean, seriously, you've only done four years of uni. It will never be enough to take you for the next 40 years of employment. That's, that's your thing. So you have to take a career break and you start asking yourself the important questions. Why did I do? Uh, why did I do what I, what, why did I do what I did in uni? What did I try and achieve? A question that you are asked when you are small, which I think is a wrong question, is, what are you doing? engineer, you a pilot, 
nitakuwa lawyer nitakuwa daktari you see but you, you were never asked what difference would you like to see in the world a small kid is aware if you ask if you ask a, a kid who's 5 years right now what difference would you like to see they've probably seen they were probably touched by someone who was unclothed or poorly clothed in town and they'll say i'd like to see those people better clothed so maybe they want to be an advocate maybe that's a kind of area they'd like to be in so you find that there's that systematic kind of way that people have been conditioned to think in a particular way so how to break it you take a break take a sabbatical and do find it different open up your mind and then now at that time start start asking yourself the difficult questions which are also simple what difference would you like to see and then once that has happened you'll find that even the engineers and all these guys will now start um thinking that I'm an engineer but then I did not go and look for work at Kenya I went and I and, and I found someone in Eldoret and I was able to to see that these guys have this kind of problem so I can be able to use my intelligence to be able to improve their lives and then what happens if you put a girl of such education in grassroots they're going to come up with a solution and a startup essentially should solve a world problem and then commercialize on it so if you solve that problem for that person on the ground they're able to commercialize mm-hmm. so you have passed through like getting the grants uh, for a startup and what can we learn from you uh dr gashigi who links me with um Vilgro Kenya and was able to get the first grant. So you see, he began with Dr. Gashigi and me sitting down with him and telling him the challenges that I have. Him seeing me every day there, first one at Gearbox, the last one to leave, trying to solve one problem, being first and then now he has what is it that I need and then you get that. The other one is if if you are motivated enough, you and if, if you have a clear vision, you will be able to convince people to come in and support you. They don't have to be people you know, could be people that you don't know, yeah. And then also the other one is um was I think that thought I that thought in my potato. Something else I had I had in my but but I've lost. Yeah. Any other uh, question? Yeah. So like uh you who are your main users for the for the startup? Like did you build the startup then figure it out how mm-hmm. to sell the product ama you knew the basing that you are pharmacist you knew there was a problem in this sector okay and you tried to solve it so okay. what approach did you use? I, I, I did not start the, the the startup from a pharmacy point of view i started it from a patient point of view because i was a patient initially and they had a real problem my leg i tore some tendons well I, i sprained badly and then i took a couple of tendons took like eight months before i went for treatment and the reconstruction took longer healing took longer the bills were up the experience was pathetic so i began from that perspective and the the lesson that i had learned my previous startup i began it in a silo and then was hoping that man i have such a good product the market will readily love it shock on me uh, it collapsed so this one i began with the users so i began it and they nurtured it with the maxillofacial surgeons within uh, the university and also private practicing so that's how i began growing and all the insights became in from there yeah. so so you sell to the patient no the the the, the buyer okay the, the beneficiary is the patient but the one who pays if the patient is insured the insurance pays if they're not it will be cash or the hospital will charge the hospital and the hospital will transfer the bill to the patient will pay however yeah how long did it take you to actually um, actualize this whole idea of yours how long did it take to for it to to be a solid thing mm. yeah if you get so I don't yeah it, it's it's not yet a perfectly solid thing where I want it to be so how long it took The, the first two years the first two years I was very fortunate enough um, to you know we all have like two sets of parents the parents who birthed you and a mentor so I, I am fortunate enough to have 
a very, very uh, great mentor. He's called Professor Simon Gudua. He's a, <coughs> he's a maxillofacial surgeon. He's one of the top, 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 top guys. So uh, he, he, he held my hand. And him being a professor, he guided me through a lot of research to be able to perfect the processes and get everything right, to work on cases slowly, build a case, and then get the product right. Uh, so that was the kind of support that I had. It took, the difference between the ideation and the first case that we did was, I think, two years. Yeah, it was, yeah, it, it was two years. And then the next one and a half years, it was continuous uh, hard go work with him yeah. until last year when the mentorship ended and he told me now the bird can leave the nest and reach it after yeah. That's when we began now uh, hitting the industry. Yeah. Did you give up like, according to you? Mm. Well, well, they gave up. Did I? I, di I didn't give up. Let me tell you why I didn't give up. You you need to have um, you need to have a certain kind of there's a support system that you need, and there's also the character that you have to have. And the kind of character that you have to have is you need to be very tenacious. You need to really hold on to something, but then you also use your head. You will be holding on to the wrong thing, yeah. But if you're holding holding on to the wrong thing is if you are still doing something that is dead and everything, if, if, if you just take one step back, you can see it's dead, but not quite hard-headed. I'm not saying you be hard-headed, saying don't quit, yeah? But if you're going to quit, quit while you are ahead. It, it, it's no shame to say that this thing collapsed and I'm going to give up on it. My first startup collapsed and I gave up on it, but I learned and then I visit on this. In terms of um, support system, um, my fiancé has been very, very supportive the whole, the whole journey. So there are days when um, things are like, you know when you're really doing something by yourself and nobody's really understanding where you're going, you need at least one person who will tell you, Sijali, still awesome. Yeah. If, if you're told that, it takes you like three weeks. Until <laughs> <laughs> the next. Until <laughs> the next. Until the next crisis. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So... Um, uh, but, the, but the, it's true, let me tell you. The, the, the informal thing that you'll never be told is you need correct life partner. Why ask a kid? This thing, people, people normally like to put it on the periphery, but if you have um, the correct life partner, someone who's supportive, someone who sees you um, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a in a good light, yeah? in the correct light of yourself, that's the kind of person who will bring you up. Uh, the other support system, of course, has been um, the, the hubs. We have four fear about to fail. Uh, on your side, how do you define failing? Is it a, is it a success to you? Or do you love it or do you have to fail? If you fail in character, you failed. If you fail in reason, you failed. Everything else is is very uh, temporal. It doesn't stick. If I come in and I, and I smack you in the head, you have the choice to smack me back or require the bigger person and you move on. So whatever you do, you are going to find challenges. But the moment you're going to say that uh, this thing has affected my character, it will affect my character, I'll now be a liar, I'll now uh, fake it, I'll now game the system, I will now uh, be a con, and I'll now chase the, the things that are passing. I'll now chase fame, and I'll, I'll now chase the gratitude right now. Once you do that, you may fail. The other failure is if you don't set goals. People don't talk about that. But if you don't set goals, you're still going to, time is still going to pass, but it's after time where you will fail in a way that you can't reverse. And that will be the time when it will be around 38 40. I'm, not, I'm not 38, 40, but at that time, we're going to realize that I am in this stage, I did not set goals, um, time has passed, and I'm a failure now. So, if you fail to set goals, you are planning to fail. If you let your character change, if you, get, uh, if you let your reason be affected, you are failed. But anything else, 
can recover. Pesa pesa ukuje naenda bwana. Given our ecosystem, right, our society right now, broadly yeah. speaking, a lot of people optimize for just personal gain. In yeah. a real sense, mm. uh, it's a tough environment, generally speaking, mm. and the majority of people will opt for that quote unquote, I don't want to say easy path, but yeah, in a sense, the character, they sell their character, or, you know, the ends justify the means. I've got, I've mm. got mine, basically, mm. right? Um, that's a society, that's an environment, largely speaking, in which you live in, mm. right? It's in the newspapers every day. Mm -hmm. you know. What is it that made you go down this other op opposite path of integrity and, and somebody who, who you are? What, what is it that mm. made you different in this sea of, you know, of everything? Yeah? Um, I've, the first one was. The bringing, upbringing is key. Like uh, for me, um, my dad was always put us in the right path. Yeah, uh, from a very early age. So it's very hard for me to to lie or steal or do things. As, as in, like it really goes very much against the the things that I believe. In. So it will take a really. It, it really has to be like life or death. Then can be a you get that's justified, but then also the other thing is accountability. You have to have a mentor, and you have to have a mentor who represents the values that you're looking, not where they are in life. You get how someone has got. Uh, if you if, if somebody comes here with a shiny Range Rover, you don't know how he got there, but he can really quickly sell to you. Uh, this is. Let me be your mentor and I'll help you get there. And you will buy it easier. But if you look for someone who has the values that you seek, yeah, people learn through infusion. You're going to get that character from that person. For me, uh, as I said, everybody has two sets of parents, the birth parents and the ones that mentor you. For me, uh, Professor Gudua, he, 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 I've worked with him for four years. And I've seen how he does his thing. I've seen integrity. I've seen consistency. I've seen hard work. I've seen passion. Yeah? I've seen compassion. So it, 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 it becomes easier for you to live up to the things that you can see. The conversation that you have with somebody who's living with the ideals and the philosophy that you want to live with, it's very easy for you to pick it up and go with it. So for me, um, other than the fact that I have never been really interested in the shiny things, I've never really been interested in um, chasing after the biggest cars or the flashiest homes or the curliest shoes or the nicest phones. Other than that, I think I feel accountable. If I go out there and prof sees that Chris is a thief, I'll feel very bad if he's disappointed in me. If, if I go out there and then my small brother sees that Chris went and stole or Chris went and uh, became a con man, I will feel very disappointed. I will feel very bad that I wasn't accountable to my small brother. So I think is that you have to, be, you have, to have the conscience that um, you are accountable to, to people. Even the people who are not looking, you are accountable to them. And, and to be honest, um, when I began, there was, there was another person who was seated on my seat. And I used to look up to him. Now, it's me <laughs> who's here talking to you guys. So there's a, there's a kind of character that I have to live with. Because when you guys make it, uh, which you all will, yeah, seven years, ten years from now, I would like us to meet and equate dignity, dignified people. Not guys who can't even look at someone in the eye because you know you did something to someone and it's out there. stuff man yeah. mr chris Baraguri, thank you so much thank you man. so much, much. you're all here in this in this, in this battlefield man i can yeah. smell the smoke on battle on you hey, it's, it's hey. dope man it's fine because your, your thought process is clear yeah there's no <clears throat> unnecessary words mm. which is pretty dope um i mean you're talking to 
folks who I believe need to be exposed to that kind of thought process. Mm, you know, mm, mm. I myself need to kind of always go back to the to the to the to the basics. Yeah. Um, because you you never arrive, right? Mm, uh, mm, and so, mm. yeah, you know. Um, mm. Thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, and I think for you, you're in a very lucky place because you you deal with the young guys, so you continuously learn and see what's happening. And that's a very unique place for for you to be in. Because the, let me tell you, for free, for free, do not ever let money or fame inflate you. When I get, so let it do you conflate. Because you're gonna, let me tell you, if you work, if you work uh, the way we have been working, eight to 10 p.m. every day, for three years, for four years, I'm going to move from point A to point B, right? I do do not want, if you point B, you, you are a proud man. Don't let pride get into you. Sit down. Yeah. Thank you very much, you guys, for having me. Awesome.